Hey guys, just a quick heads up before we get into the video proper. Wanted to let you all know that this video is going to have a lot of Gaelic names in it. I went out of my way to try to make sure that I got the pronunciations as close as I can. Uh, I don't speak Gaelic, so obviously they're not going to be perfect. And I may have some wrong if you do speak. Please let me know and I will try to update them in later videos. But I do have some subtitles for those of you who are not used to hearing the names pronounced. I just want to let you all know that uh, you might want to make use of those because none of the words sound like they are spelled. And you may have been saying them wrong this entire time and never know. Uh, I know I was. Generation 1 of Mabinogi has not aged well, in my opinion. The story is still very interesting, but you run back and forth a lot. Translating books, showing the translated books to people, and waiting on Torlok to stop being a bear. So instead of this video being an exhaustive walkthrough, I will summarize the plot in broad strokes, and then we'll explore some of the real-world inspirations behind the characters and lore. Mabinogi is an old game, drawing loose inspiration from even older mythology. It's something unique to the game that can, maybe accidentally, lend an air of mystery and confusion to its chapter-based storyline. Today, let's peel back that mystery and look at the myth behind these old stories from Grandma. Before we get started, I just want to give a heads up that the Mabinogion is confusing in its own right. Many sources on the original pre-Christian mythos suffer from heavy synchronization from ancient Rome. Newer sources are post-Christian typically, with gods becoming hero kings or demons or so on. Many things have been lost to time, and there are many tellings of these stories, so I apologize if I do get anything wrong or if I find sources that contradict what you may know. Generation 1 introduces us to Morrigan goddess of war and revenge. She calls upon the Milesian to come to her aid, which leads us to a man living as a druid far to the frozen north of Sleepy Tear Hanel. The druid Torlok warns the Milesian not to go to Morgan's aid, claiming she is a traitor, having abandoned humankind to aid the evil Fomorians. The Milesian investigates in spite of the druid's warning, and finds himself tracing the steps of the arc wizard, Mors. Believed dead after falling the last battle of Moitira, Mors had been Torlok's mentor, and a vital figure in the war against the Fomorians. More on the battle later, but we discover that Mors' family had been slaughtered, and his home set to the torch shortly after his disappearance. The player discovers that Mors has learned of this tragedy, and has abandoned his humanity to declare himself as Fomor, aiding them in resurrecting Glaskovnan a giant who had been used against the Tuaha Day in the First Battle of Moitira. Mm -hmm. 
Using memorial items to view the past, the player discovers that Torlok and two of his companions had encountered Moors while searching for the mythical land of Tir Nanag. Morgan had commanded Moors to slay the three young heroes, but Moors had recognized one of the trio as his daughter, Mariota Gwydion, and hesitated. A dark lord under Morgan's command instead attacked the three, leaving their fate uncertain. Torlok later regained consciousness inside the depths of Ravi's labyrinth without his companions, his wounds being attended to by a succubus that had fallen deeply in love with him during his quest for Tir Nanag. She warned the young Torlok that, should he leave, he would never return to her alive. Nevertheless, Torlok set out to find his friends. This decision permanently weakened the young druid, forcing him to sustain himself by taking on the form of a bear during the day and consuming mana herb only returning to his human form at night. The Milesian's investigation eventually uncovers that Torlok had not truly met Morrigan. Instead, Cycle, the Fomorian king, had taken her form of the glamour to deceive Moors and enlist his aid. Torlok, aside himself that he had not realized sooner, gives the Milesian a black rose and instructs them to deliver it to the priestess Christel in the city of Dunbarnum. Christelle reveals herself to be none other than the succubus who had loved Torlok so long ago, and, seeing the rose, agrees to help the player reach the land of the Fomors. After opening the gateway to the crossroads, and crossing into the other world, the player finds an eerie mirror of the Tir Hanel they know. However, this reflection is a ghost town, empty, save for hordes of monsters, and a sole survivor. Dougal. The Milesian plunges the depths of Albay Dungeon, ultimately freeing the goddess Morrigan and returning to Dougal, who is the soul of Glosk of Nan in a human shell. The player returns to the world they know and confronts Cycle. Cycle calls upon the resurrected giant Glosk of Nan to slay the Milesian, but the giant is ultimately defeated. Moors reveals he had purposely weakened the giant, for he had known since his encounter with his daughter that the Fomorian king was not the true Morrigan. Cycle reveals that he had actually accounted for this, and had intended the giant to be defeated from the beginning. The giant's corpse erupts into an explosion of Dark Urg, tearing a hole that connects the world of the Fomors to Aaron. Moors attacks Cycle, but even the Archmage is helpless when confronted by a god, and is wounded while protecting the player from Cycle's spells. Morrigan appears and intervenes before Cycle can attack the Milesian once more, and challenges him. He declines, stating she is still far too weak from being sealed. The Fomorian king then flees, and now appears and approaches Moors. She reveals herself to be his daughter, Mariota, reborn as the guardian of the soul stream. Morrigan thanks the player for their service, and warns them that there are darker days ahead. The Milesian and Morrigan leave Morza now to say goodbye, and the credits roll. That takes us to the end of Generation 1. Let's touch briefly on some of the characters who played major roles in the story, and talk about where the inspiration was drawn first. Let's start with Gloss. In the original mythology, the name Gloss Gunan is given to a cow. Gloss means green, and the cow is often described as white with green spots. Gavnan, as far as I can tell, is the name of a smith who received the cow from Baylor in exchange for a sword. There is some contention over if Gavnan means of the smith or if it was literally his name, and he just named the cow after himself. The cow is something of a fertility figure, and is noted to give off unlimited milk. I'm honestly not sure how they got a winged giant with really bad breath out of a magical cow, uh, but the connection may be that the giant is built from metal bones and as such would be smithed. It's also possible that the giant is a personification of the sword given to Baylor, as we know that it appeared in the first battle of Moitora.
Now, Morrigan, or THE Morrigan, as she's often called in the epics, the Morgan has a bit of a holy trinity thing going on, and might be more of a title than a name. The Morrigan is often made up of Bibe, Naunum, and Matcha, with Bibe being the one closest to the Morgan we see in the game. In some tellings, the three are sisters, but it's also possible that they are different names for a single goddess with multiple aspects. Bibe's domain is war and fate, but in the game she is given war and vengeance, and in both she is associated with crows, having black wings in game, and later her demigod abilities surround the player with shadowy figures resembling birds. Her name, too, is fairly interesting. Moor seems to come from an Indo-European root word, and means terror or denotes monstrous aspects. The modern word, nightmare, also shares this root while Rigan translates to Queen, and so the name as a whole is often translated to the Phantom Queen. She seems to have been something of a doomsayer, often warning warriors of their impending death by sending dreams of her laundering their bloody armor, and in the story of Moitera, she even prophesizes the end of the world. Torlok, though, I couldn't find anything too direct for. It's from the name Tortlebach, which is a pretty common name historically, with a few kings of Ireland having the name, along with a few other notable cultural figures. There was an 11th century king of Ireland. He wasn't any sort of wizard, but he did fall ill and supposedly had injuries that he never truly recovered from that may have caused his death, but that connection feels like a stretch. His bear transformation didn't have any direct parallels I could find either, but there is evidence that Celtic druids exalted bears and worshipped a pair of bear gods. Uh, there was also a king, Art, who was known as the Lonely Bear, and his moniker eventually became a clan name, but since we're never given Torlok's last name, it may be totally unrelated. I can't find anything about Mary, either. Mariota is a super common name historically, and I didn't find anyone that sounded close while I researched. For Rory, we'll touch on him in the Generation 2 video. Cycle is kind of interesting, though. In-game, it's implied that he's a newer king of the Fomors, but in the original mythology, he seems to have been the first. There's not a lot said about him that I can find. The only source that I was able to dig up stated he came to Ireland with 800 Fomors, and most of them were slain in a war against the Partholons. The Partholons themselves come up later in the story, so we will just glance over them for now. It is worth noting that Cycle may have been crippled. He's often given epithets like withered feet, and one source says men with single arms and single legs they were who joined the battle with him. Take from that what you will. Moors and Jabchel also turn up nothing. I thought maybe finding one would lead me to the other, but as far as I can tell these two are game original. The only thing I can think of is that at one point in the Battle of Moitira, there is a harp, or maybe a harp player, it's a little vague, uh, that kills some people, but that's very tenuous, and even though Jabshell is later tied to magic music, uh, in the Battle of Moitira, he is supposed to have cast a spell that caused the moon to break into chunks and rain onto the battlefield. I don't know. I don't really have anything for this one. I even checked Wikipedia, thinking maybe they'd have something, since they are both kind of wizardy, but they didn't. Anyway, that is all for today's video. Thank you guys so much for watching to the end, if you're still here. Uh, I plan on doing a brief video about the continent of Alu, uh, where the place names are drawn from. Then, the Generation 2 video should come sometime after. Uh, I still need to record the footage for that and do my research. I'm trying to cut down on my production time and get these things out a little faster. So maybe about two weeks, maybe about a month, I'm not sure. Just depends on how we're going. I also have some non-mobby videos in the pipeline, so ring the subscribe button and click the bell if you're interested in what's up next.